if your faith is contingent on the idea that the Quran is perfectly preserved, there are no textual variants whatsoever, there are no changes in any letters or words or anything like that, then, again, if it's contingent on that by itself, then you will not stay in Islam. All right, we're recording now. Awesome. So, so, <clears throat> so pretty much, hey guys, <laughs> um, <laughs> just, you know, kind of just recording here. So we, um, so today we're actually talking about a, um, one of the fields that I personally love to talk about is when it comes to things like where Muslims talk about the corrupted text of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so today we're just corrupted. pretty much. Cor yeah, corrupted. <laughs> corrupted. Yeah. yeah. So, so today that we're actually covering over that specifically, um, and you guys know who I am. And um, if you want to introduce yourself, I won't. Yeah, for sure. You know. Yeah. Go ahead and give your bio. It's all good. Yeah. Hey guys, what's going on? So this is the Amen Podcast. I have a channel here on YouTube uh, where I do polemics against Islam and I do apologetics uh, for the gospel. So defending the gospel. Um, uh, pretty active on Clubhouse a lot, active here on YouTube, started on TikTok, uh, had to get off of it because it's a flaming dumpster fire. Uh, so now uh, I'm here with my buddy Hunter and we're doing this live stream. So uh, he's going to kind of tackle some of the uh, biblical stuff about uh, textual variants and things like that. And I guess what Muslims will use to chest dump as a contradiction, quote unquote. So he's going to give a really good explanation of that. Um, and I'll kind of give like a brief synopsis of like what Muslims believe um, according to whatever they think the Quran says. Uh, so kind of like the Islamic view about uh, biblical corruption. So, yeah. Yeah. So what is the Quranic view or the Islamic view of biblical corruption? Uh, like we talked about like contradictions, things like that. But mm -hmm. um, really, sometimes when it comes to that, it's like. They talk about more than just that, and right. so what? Like, you want to start off with like some like verses or something like that to where they get this from, yeah. things like that. Because I know from the Quran, it claims to like people follow nothing but like conjecture or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, there, yeah, Go yeah. Ahead. So there's, I'll, I'll give you one um, that they'll use sometimes. Just like I said, I'll try to be as brief as possible because there's not really much to say. Because what they'll do is they'll build on stuff and kind of just come up with their own ideas. Um, I don't know if you can share screen on here, but can you go to um, Quran.com no. um, and go to Surah um, 3, verse 78? Yep. Uh, let's see. 3. No, I never. Oh, there it is. 3. I think I'm in 3. <laughs> I, I, you can tell I never use this. So three verse. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Let me get. And sorry if my uh, my lighting keeps going in and out. I don't know what it is. It's something weird with my camera, but the audio should be pretty good. No, that's okay. Let me share a screen. Uh, there it is. Okay. So there's that. Yeah. So, sir, three for 78. Can you zoom in a bit when you get to it? Yeah, I can try. Hang on. Actually, I can make it to where. Let me see if I can. Whoop. There. Does that work better? Cool. Yeah, that's cool. You said verse 78. Yep. Verse Actually, you know, it started at 76. Okay. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, actually, if you, if you don't mind. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so 376. Absolutely, those who honor their trust and shun evil, surely Allah loves those who are mindful of him. Indeed, those who trade Allah's covenant and their oaths for a fleeting gain will have no share in the hereafter. Mm -hmm. Allah will neither speak to them nor look at them nor purify them on the day of judgment, and they will suffer painful punishment. Verse 78. There are some among them who distort the book with their tongues to make you think this distortion is from the book. But it, 
Um, but it is not what the book says. They say it is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And so they attribute lies to Allah knowingly. Right. So so before we even get into the tafsir for this, I'm going to specifically, we're going to go into Ibn Kathir. But before we even get into that, what they'll do is they'll point to this. They'll point to some verses in um, um, Surah Al-Baqarah, that's chapter two. They'll, they'll point to a lot of stuff and they'll say, hey, you know, the Quran says that your book is corrupt. Like when it's talking about the people of the book, the Ahl al-Kitab, which is the Jews and the Christians, they'll say those people, um, yeah, your, your, your book is corrupt. Um, however, when you're actually reading it in context, it says things like, you know, they twist the book with their tongues, right? It doesn't say that the actual book is corrupt. It just says that they twist it with their tongues. Um, so for instance, what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll point that and say, hey, look, when you actually think about it, how would you even know that something is twisted? How would you even know that something is corrupt um, unless you have the original with you, right? So this is why when you go um, uh, to verses like um, Sir 2, verse 101, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but, but I believe it says like, um, uh, which is like, you know, confirming the book or confirming what, what they had with them. There's other verses, um, um, Masojikun Lima Bene Yadehi, confirming what they have between their hands. So the Quran takes this position of the book, the uh, kitab that was given to um, Isa and to uh, Musa. Uh, those books are still intact. And what people are doing is they're corrupting them by twisting what it actually says. So mm -hmm. if, if, if you don't mind, could you go back to um, Quran.com and I want to look at the tafsir for, for that actual ayah. Yeah, uh, let me get it real quick. Let me get it back. Mm -hmm. Share screen. I don't know what's up with my screen, man. It keeps going in and out like that. No, nah, that's okay. All right, cool. So there's that. Does it is it better when I do it like this? Yeah, can you zoom in a little bit? Uh, Are you on a Mac? No, I am on a uh, PC. Yeah. Okay, if you hold Command and then press and then press the plus button, it should zoom in a bit. You I mean think. Control? Or yeah, control. I'm sorry. I've. Hey, look at there. Yeah, you Android people. Um, <laughs> I'm actually an iPhone guy. Like I'm Apple. IPhone guy? Yeah. So what happened, man? What's going on? Man, I had to get a computer. So you know, I had to make, <laughs> I make things work. There's a website called uh, Newegg, Newegg.com mm -hmm. that gives. Uh, you can buy refurbished Macs for like dirt cheap. But um. Okay. If you uh, so so you see where it says sir three for seventy eight. There's uh, a. Yeah. There's a book icon right underneath the, the, the play icon. Yeah. Click on that. Okay. And scroll down. So so this is Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Keep scrolling a bit. Okay, right there. So it says uh, those who distort the book with their tongues. Yep. Yeah. So I'll I'll go ahead and, and, and read that really quick. So, uh, so it's talking about this part of the ayah. So who distort the book with their tongues means they alter them, Allah's words, right? So they're altering the word. They're not actually corrupting the actual book. Right. Yeah. So it says Al Bukhari reported that Ibn Abbas said that I am means that they alter and add. Now, look what it says, although none among Allah's creation can remove the words of Allah from his books, they alter and distort their apparent meanings. Um, then it says, why have been said the Torah and the Injil remain as Allah revealed them and no letter in them was removed. Now, notice what it says. However, the people misguide others by addition and false interpretation, relying on books that they wrote themselves. Mm. Now, we're, now, we're not going to read the whole tafsir, but I'll just I'll land with this. When you go through this tafsir, there are sections where it talks about how like the, the Christians at that time were writing books in Arabic um, and the translations were horrible and they added things or they subtracted things. Or what they'll do is like if you continue to, to go down, it talks about like the um, can't think of the word off the top of my head, but in, in Arabic, it's, it's been a long day, but it's like the mafus, <laughs> like the 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 guarded tablets. It says like if you know, uh, even though like Allah has them on guarded tablets, um, when you actually um, matter of fact, if, if, if you don't mind, can you go down so we can look at it? Because I don't want to. Yeah. yeah, this is the end of it right here. OK, yeah, yeah. So I'll just read this one and then I'll wrap it up. So it says, they say this is from a law, but it's not from a law. And this is what Ibn Kathir says about it. As for Allah's books, they are still preserved and cannot be changed. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded this statement. However, if Wahib meant the books that are currently in the hands of the people of the book, the Hela Kitab, 
then we should state that there is no doubt that they are altered, distorted, added to, and deleted from them. Now notice what now notice what he's getting ready to say after this. Remember? Yeah. So before what he was saying was it was the the translations. No one, he said, no one can change any letter from his books, the Torah and the Injil. You can't do it. It's not possible. Now notice what he says. If we keep reading, he says, for instance, the Arabic versions of these books contain tremendous error, right? Many additions mm -hmm. and deletions and enormous misinterpretations. What are they though? They're the translations, right? So if you keep reading, it says, uh, can you move up, scroll up just a little bit? Uh, that's the furthest to go. I can zoom in more though. Well, no, the, um, the, uh, my, uh, my, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause my, my yeah. part of the camera is like over it. It says those who render these translations, notice again, translations, those who render these translations have incorrect comprehension in most rather all of these translations. So he's saying not even just some, all of them, but notice what they are, the translations, not the originals. Mm. If Wahid meant the books of a law that he has with him, then indeed these books are preserved and will never change. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, they'll go to the top of this paragraph and say, oh, well, these are the ones that are preserved um, on the, the guarded tablets or something. Well, I mean, that's not even what this is specifically talking about. He's talking about if Wahid meant the books of a law that he has with him, that Wahid has with him, the untranslated versions, those are preserved and were never changed. If they want to say that these are the uh, mafuz, like those guarded tablets, um, the problem with that is no one can read them. So with the like guarded tablets, that's not, is that like a thing like with Joseph Smith or something like with the golden tablets or something? So, so the Muslims believe that this, the, the, the speech of the Quran is eternal Mm -hmm. Um, so essentially you can kind of see where they get this from because even in the Quran, um, Isa is called the Kalimatu who Allah wa ruh min Allah, which is like a word from Allah and a spirit from him. They don't associate, they they won't associate um Isa with like the actual eternal speech of Allah, but you can see where they get these ideas from, they steal it from the Christians, right? Mm -hmm. But essentially, what's going on here is they'll take uh, this eternal speech of a law and they'll say that's what's guarded on the tablets, but that's not what's actually like, you know, um, it's not the same thing as like what the Christians think. So the eternal speech of a law um, is eternal, but it is not a law. So it's eternal with a law, but not. Uh, so now they have an issue because now you have two eternal being. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? It gets really weird. Yeah. No, that um, that's what they believe it is. Yeah, no, that, yeah, no, that is um, that's interesting in and of itself right there. Well, real quick, let me actually just um, bring something up because I do know when it comes to, like, for example, any – well, really when it comes to anything about <clears throat> the originals. Um, so one of the – one of the books that I read, and actually I got all my my whole bookshelf right here. Some and some things you'll see where I have a bookcase, like every other Christian on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. You see but, my bookcase back there. Yeah, but like <laughs> this is a good book, which yeah. I recommend. It's written yeah. by Elijah Hicks and Peter J. Gurry. Okay. And even Peter Gurry uh, in the book, and he actually talks about actually. Let me just. See, I remember what page it's on. He was like, "Yep, there it is." So he, and I got to hear. He, so he actually reads about how it's worth mentioning how rarely editors of the Greek New Testament have to guess or conjecture. There's that word. What the original text is. So, in other words, how rarely editors have concluded that all our manuscripts are wrong and the original text is simply not to be found in any of them. Pretty much, he's saying it's a bit overstating, and so. We and I've talked to people who was like, "Oh, you believe in a corrupted book? You know, you don't know if that's original or not." It's like, no, actually, according to the <laughs> the the study itself, it's actually where we can know very well what um, the original is. He actually and I um had it pulled up here. Uh, he actually yeah. said that he even mentions about the Nestle Allen. I don't know if you know what that is. I don't uh, actually, and and uh, sorry if uh, if my volume is going in and out. I'm muting myself when I'm not talking. I'm at home today. This is like my day off, so I'm not at my usual spot. So I got a lot of yeah. background noise. No, but, uh, but yeah, please enlighten me. So Nestle Allen 
is one of the Greek and English New Testament that are used by people who study textual criticism. And he even – so we have the – this is the 28th edition, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that they're coming out soon with the 29th edition. But he even goes on to say where in the Nestle Allen, that's what that is, the 13th edition uh, that was published in 2012 bear witness to the remarkable reliability of the New Testament text, and now we're at the 28th edition. So from the 13th edition, he says the New Testament is very reliable. We know very well what the autographs, originals, however you want to say it, said. Now we have the 28th edition, and he said that was a 13th edition, so just do the math. And so when it comes to the idea about how like changing words, adding to it, or anything like that, it's that, in my opinion, to say that is a bit conjecture in and of itself. It's a bit of an overstatement to say you don't know what anything says because you don't have the original. It's just like, yes, we do. If you put in every – and I, I've said this so many times. It's almost becoming like a – like I feel like a parrot. I keep on repeating it. But even if you were to name every contradiction or every textual variant, all of those things, like let's just say for the sake of arguments, not saying that is true, but let's right. say for the sake of arguments, we just – you know, that's all – okay, said and well done. But you still have the essential Christian doctrines where there are – no contradictions about it. Where did Jesus was Jesus crucified? Was he not crucified? There's no contradiction. He was crucified on all accounts. When it comes to the resurrection, all accounts say that there was an empty tomb. <laughs> and then all accounts that talk about what happened afterwards say that the disciples experienced a bodily risen Jesus. So in all accounts, there is no contradiction about it. And I actually um made a note about that as well because um Whenever it comes to multiple people, this is across the board, and this is written in uh, this is written in the book that I just uh, referenced, myth and mistakes, uh, but also reference in uh, non-Christian sources, things like that. Um, but they even go on to say about how with like they quote Dan Wallace, they quote Bart Ehrman, two of the biggest names in the field, right? And yet they both say the same thing that. They admit that the non-essential beliefs or practices seem um, like no, like pretty much not affected. And then, actually, in an interview, this is uh, this actually was recorded where, um, actually, just to put it, I'll restrict it. I have it on here on the Google Drive. Here it is. There's, a, there's also something I wanted to ask you about earlier, um, yeah. be, because, um, but I, I'll, I'll wait till you get done with this. But just keep this in your mind. I remember sure. about two weeks ago, because you know we're we're on Clubhouse a lot. Yeah. Um, maybe about two or three weeks ago, um, the Muslim that we interact with a lot named Amir Blanco on there, he mm -hmm. he was misrepresenting something. And I was just like, man, like y'all should just debate about it. But it has something to do with this, didn't it? Like he was he was citing some kind of quote unquote scholar and was saying that. But I can't remember what it was about, but I knew it had something to do with textual criticism. Do, do you remember what that was specifically? Yeah. So he was. um Whenever we were talking about it, um, the there was somebody that came on, and it was like for the longest of time, like all the way back from like the 20s or something like that in the 1900s, it was like we cannot know what the autographs were. We cannot know what the – uh, the originals say what so what pretty much whatsoever, like really reaching it. And so I actually quoted scholars that say, no, we actually know what the – we actually know uh, for certain that no essential Christian doctrines are affected whatsoever. And so when you have – even the Trinity is counted into that, by the way, and that's not affected by it either. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, when it came to Bart Ehrman, of all people, he was actually uh, quoted about First John 5-7, which is a one that a lot of people use. And whenever it comes to it – let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so Bart Ehrman was actually asked in an interview once about First John 5 7. And the guy who was asking him a question, it was like they were at a restaurant or something. And yep. he was asked, you know, if First John 5 7 is not original, then why do Christians still argue for the Trinity? And he just flat out says, because it's uh, 
because that's not the only verse that gives us the Trinity. He said every no Christian doctrine is based on one verse. And so, for example, if you want to talk about a textual variant like Mark 1.1, 1, 1, one of the ones that get brought up a lot is Son of God. But we do know with the book of Mark across the board, he is called the Son of God in multiple texts. So it's not just based on one single verse. It's based on multiple verses throughout the New Testament. And so that's why it's it's never hinged on one verse. No doctrine is. And to say that because this one isn't original, or if you want to say there's a textual variant, that doesn't hurt us at all. We can just simply say, okay, if there are textual variants or anything like that, we have other verses that don't have any textual variants about it. And that's where, um, that's where actually, and I was trying to find it, um, if I can, let me see, yeah. hold on. You know, what's interesting too, uh, while you do that, I'll just, I'll just speak on this a little bit with, yeah. uh, in reference to Islam. What the Muslims fail to realize is that any book from antiquity will have um, some kind of variance within them. No book, it's not, it's not even possible. No book that is ever written from antiquity has uh, zero variance. And um, when we're talking about variance, we're not talking about something to where it's like, um, you know, oh, well, um, something is just completely different. Like, kind of like some of the examples we were given earlier. What we're talking about variance is, um, and this is what I was talking to you on the phone the other day about, um, you know, one will say J O H N, and then another manuscript will, will spell it J O N. That's oh, yeah. an actual variant, right? So, you know, when we're talking about what a variant is, a variant is not necessarily a contradiction, but a contradiction can be a variant. Um, however, I believe the scripture is inerrant, I don't believe that there are any contradictions. However, we know for a fact that there are textual variants. That's just the way books from antiquity work. Uh, Muslims, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, and that's that's even when it comes to the Quran. I actually, um, where is it? I have a study Quran. And All right. If we ever, you're gonna pull out that thing from uh, Daniel Brubaker. No. So I have this. It's an actual study Quran that's done in Islamic studies, and I have it highlighted where they actually talk about textual variants in the study Quran itself. And so it's like if you want to talk about perfectly preserved 100 percent like there's no issues or anything like that the quran has it too and yep so and they it what's interesting enough is whenever you're whenever you look at the footnote for example um you have people who have brought this attention to to you know the average person mm -hmm. you know level things like that and the Islamic scholars are even talking about how it's an interpretation. And I hear all the time from um, people who are of the Islamic faith that I'll just call them Muslims. I didn't want to like, you know, just point at it, but you know, I mean, that's, that's, what, they Muslims. That, yeah. that, that, that's what we're talking about. So, so, right, like, yeah, so I mean, we're talking about you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> interesting enough, I have heard Muslims actually say it's that it's not a state of history. It's an interpretation. Okay. And so if I actually open up, to one of these textual variants, uh, and I actually had a bookmark here. Uh, here it is. Um, the good old Kutila versus Katila. Right, they so kill it, or fighting yeah. or be killed and things like that. Yeah, chapter chapter 3, verse 146, or however you say surah, all that stuff. Mm. I'm not an Islamic scholar, so no, I just... Okay, dude. I'm not an Islamic scholar either. <laughs> you know, Y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? So anyways... You, so, said, it's, you, you, you said it's chapter 3, which verse? 146 is the one that reads in this one. Okay. So it so this is in a commentary that's also in the study Quran, and mm -hmm. it says some read fight Katila as were killed Kutila, in which case it would mean, and how many a prophet was killed while there were alongside him many de uh, devoted men. Yep. Al Tabari uh, prefers this interpretation. So. It's talking about how, um, as it records, or sorry, as it accords with the plain sense of the previous verses, and so, again, I've heard so I've I've heard Muslims talk about all the time that it's not a state of history; it's a state of interpretation. He just said that that Al Tabari prefers this interpretation, right. but based off of what though? Because it yeah. follows in line with the more previous text. Well. Again, that's just based on interpretation. That's not based on actual history. And, I, and I'm not saying that that's wrong or anything. Mm -hmm. What I'm just stating is that it's it's inconsistent on 
if you're saying that it's not a sense of history, it's a sense of interpretation. Well, if that's the case, then Islamic scholars are based on an off of interpretation. Yep. Because that's literally what they say in their commentary in the study Quran. So you know, you know, I also wanted to uh I, I shared my screen. I don't know if you can add it to the stream really quick because I wanted to share this with you as well. Um Boom. yeah, awesome. So this is so this is actually the verse that you brought up. So this is Surah Ali so this is Surah Ali Imran. I uh 146 and I, I just wanted to share this with people who may not know uh and guys uh real quick if you're listening to this because this is pre-recorded so you're going to be listening to this um <laughs> on like the you know the premiere feature on youtube or however it is make sure that you guys like the stream mm. like the video share it with your friends comment under the actual video for the algorithm um, we're not asking for anything else. We're just asking for for likes and comments. And the reason why is because when you do that, it tells YouTube that you're enjoying this video and it'll push it out to more people so they can get this information because this information is not known. But um, I, I wanted to share this really quick because a lot of people don't know on Quran.com, there is a translation called the Fidel Solomon Briggs translation. And when you read it, um, it has all of the different Quran. And it tells you, so in the original, um, most people read Hafs. Um, imagine how many devotees fought along with their prophets and never faltered despite whoever or wh whatever losses they suffered in the case of Allah, nor did they weaken or give in, right? But in the Fidel Solomon Briggs translation, he, he states that there is a Qur'at, there's a variant. So uh, Qur'at is like reading, uh, it's a different reading. And it says how and how many a prophet has had numerous godly people combating. If you click on the two right here, it tells you Qur'at. I'll go down some. Qur'at, Nafai, Ibn Kathir, uh, Abu Amr, and Yaqub read it as numerous godly people killed. So one and so one involves people are just fighting. The other says that people are killing. So what they'll do is they'll say, okay, well, you know, it kind of means the same thing. You know, if you're, if you're fighting, then you're killing, right? Or so blah, blah, blah. However, this proves. So if, if you want to say that these variants are consolidated and that they complement each other um, in some kind of way, then cool. But now this proves that there's more than one Quran because one reads it one way, one reads it the other. It destroys the standard Islamic narrative because just because you fight somebody doesn't mean you kill them, right? Right. So you can fight and not kill, or you can fight and kill. So these there's, these are two different readings. I just want to give you guys one more, um, just so we can hammer this point in. I was on Reason Answers podcast last night uh, with Thaddeus and with a couple of other brothers. Uh, Black Doctor was on there. Shout out to Thaddeus. <laughs> yeah, man, dude's awesome. I've, I've reached out to him. He said that... Um, he would allow me to come on his stream and do a um, uh, give a presentation. I wanted to do a presentation on the crucifixion, hmm. um, kind of like the crucifixion according to Islam and kind of like where they even got the idea from. Um, but anyways, um, so I was on his um, podcast or his stream last night with Mary um, a black doctor and some of the other brothers. Um, and we had a Muslim come on and he said the same thing. They pair it. There's no variance or anything like that. This is one of the ones that I brought up. Um, are you familiar with this one, Hunter? Have you ever heard this one? Uh, let's see. Let me look. Um, this is Surah 3712. Oh, here. Let me actually edit this a little bit more so that I'm not. Boom. Uh, okay there that way i'm not taking up the whole screen okay, no actually fine. yeah so actually no i'm not familiar with this one mm -hmm. yeah so this is one um avery actually uh got logic apologetics he was the one who actually i first heard using this argument um and it's valid because um okay so so we'll so so we'll read it in fact you are astonished by their denial while they ridicule you i wouldn't this is a bad trans if, like fy i'm not a an arabic uh, expert, uh, uh, but so so what I'll do is I normally I've I've been studying the language um, for a little bit under two years now, 
Um, and I, I purposely started doing that because I've noticed that whenever I read a translation, they lie about stuff. And I got so tired of Muslims lying to me that I started to, to study the language. So I mainly study um, uh, the Quranic Arabic. I'm not really, I don't really care too much about uh, colloquial Arabic, like the Masri or like the Levantine dialect or anything like that. My main focus is just on the, the classical Arabic, the Quranic Arabic, what it says and kind of how to understand it. So this word, astonished, they've, they've translated incorrectly. The Arabic verb is ajib, which means um, to, to wonder, to be shocked, to be amazed, right? And if you notice right here, this word, this is um, ajibta, it's being, notice they, they have the right translation here, you wonder. But notice what they do. Uh, Mustafa Kitab, in his translation, he does astonished. And I'm going to explain to you why they do that. Um, so if you read it, so it says, in fact, you are astonished by their denial while they ridicule you. Now, there is a qura'at. There is a variant reading of this in the Hamza al-Qasai, al in the Khalif. They read it as, and they translate it incorrectly again. Rather, I gravely noted as a ridicule. So I'm, I'm going to explain this really quick, and then I'll pass it back to you. Sorry, I'm kind of no, taking you're over good. stream. No, no, no. <laughs> it's fine. It's ours. So um, I'm um, enjoying it. Yeah, so uh, if, if we read it in Arabic, it reads, Bel ajibta waskurun, right? So what this is saying is like, so this word, um, ajibta, when it has the uh, um, fatha over the ta right here, it changes um, the speaker. So in this one, it is um, Muhammad. In fact, you, in reference to Muhammad, Rather, you are astonished by their denial, right? So Allah is saying that Muhammad is, uh, I don't want to use the word astonished. Muhammad is shocked. He's surprised. He's wondering, right? Uh, he wonders, right? Um, or he's shocked, amazed, right? Um, by their denial. And they even translate it correctly for this part, amazed. Um, but now in the Qur'at, in the Hamza reading, there would be a dhamma over this. Um, and I can even pull it up in a second. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll let you, I'll, I'll kind of get your thoughts on it before I, um, while I'm pulling it up. Yep. But, um, but when you put a dhamma over this, it changes the speaker. Now it's Allah, bal ajib tu, right? So now it's Allah being shocked, being amazed, wondering why they're mocking, right? So now we have two different readings. One is Muhammad is shot. The other reading in the Hamza is Allah is shot. And this is the reason, so I said, I'm going to come back to this. This is the reason why they won't render this correctly. They won't render it shocked or amazed um, because now you have theological implications. So now you're saying that a law can be shocked. If a law can be shocked, that's a big issue because you can do something to catch a law off guard. So this destroys this idea that there's only one uh, Quran. If the Muslims want to go and, and I'll let you kind of because I, I, I'm curious as, as to what you'll say about this. If, if the Muslims want to say, hey, you know what? OK, fine. There's variant readings. Yes, there are different Qur'ans or, you know, different readings that say different things. But we know that this is the most attested to reading because maybe there's more manuscripts that read this. Then fine, because we can say the same thing within Christianity. We have over 5,000 Koine Greek manuscripts, over 10,000 Latin and thousands of other languages all attesting to the same thing. Right. And we, we don't have, you know, we can have 99 readings saying Jesus um, walked here and one reading that says Jesus walked there. Well, we're going to go with the 99 as opposed to the one. So if the Muslims will be honest and say this book from antiquity, this is the reading, then fine, we'll give it to you. But since they want to consistently lie and say that there's only one reading of the Quran from the time of Muhammad to now, then we're just going to keep busting you guys upside the head with this. What makes this even worse is that this is on Quran.com. This isn't a, a Christian website. So um, what are your thoughts on this? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to pull up the actual reading yeah, for it. it. So that you guys won't think that I'm lying. Um, but like, like, 
what do you think about this? And, and kind of like, how do you think that, you know, this will correlate to Christianity in terms of like manuscripts? I'm, I'm actually curious. Yeah. So pretty much it pretty, it's right on what you said, where it comes to if there are 99 manuscripts and you have one variant within these uh, streams of, you know, of manuscript tradition, so to speak, then we can actually tell where that actually came from. Um, but it's almost like, if I'm not mistaken, it seems to be the case that 99% of Muslims believe that there is only one Quran, that there is no difference in letters or like no no different whatsoever. It is 100% the exact same. Christians don't make that claim. We are very open to the fact that, yes, we know that there are textual variants, but at the same time, even with the textual variants, Christianity is still true, no matter what, because that's what it shows us. And so if your faith is contingent on the idea that the Quran is perfectly preserved, there are no textual variants whatsoever, there are no changes in any letters or words or anything like that, then – Again, if it's contingent on that by itself, then you will not stay in Islam because of that. Except when it comes to Christians, we can still have textual variants, and we know where those textual variants are. And yet still Christianity is true because you still have, like I said before, the essential Christian doctrine. So either way, no matter what, when you talk about textual criticism or anything like that, or even even contradictions, for example, because historically speaking, the the um, even if you want to point out a contradiction or something like that, which again I don't agree that there are really any, if any at all, I haven't looked at every single one, just for the record. Um, <laughs> and with that being the case, Christianity is still true because the core central doctrines right. are still intact um and that's actually what i was going to show uh, so why you pull that up um mm -hmm. i was actually going to show this um let me see Whoop. so this right here some so this is where like it comes to textual criticism like some um well, let me just read it here so sometimes the impression from the apologetic literature is that variants do not matter Others are more caref careful to claim that no – I'm sorry. Let me reread that. Others are more careful to claim only that no orthodox doctrine or ethical practice of Christianity depends solely on any disputed wording. And this is, again, from Myths and Mistakes. Um, and it, by the way, that's written by two PhDs. Um, and Peter Gurry, you know, he's one that I enjoy reading. He graduated from Cambridge, and he was a um, student of daniel as well and he actually talks about how daniel wallace is even more precise admitting that some non-central beliefs or practices seem to be affected by ver viable variants but that no viable variant affect any cardinal truth of the new testament both qualifications viable and cardinal are important and match what we have here called difficult and important variants in this sense wallace is surely right that no core doctrine e.g the resurrection, the deity of Christ, salvation, the Trinity, is based solely on a textual difficult passage. Even Bart Ehrman, and I have his quote too, grants that his own view is not a problem for this conclusion. He has said publicly that his view is not at odds with that of his mentor Bruce Metzger, which is that essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. And I don't remember where I put that. Um, let me see. Oh, actually, let me get the quote for you here. I have it right here. So this is actually um in Misquoting Jesus. Okay, is the book that I have. And if I actually go to this, let me go to it. So whenever, so for example, you brought up Amir, um, the Muslim we were talking to the other day. He talked mm -hmm. about how. Where, I'm listening to you, by the way. I'm just I'm pulling no, up fine. this information to share with you. Yeah. No, you're fine. So he brought up about how it's a lie um, that we can't know what the essentials are or not the essentials, the um, the original say or anything like that. And that I was I, in the same exact room where the whole conversation even started. They were all saying that Bart Ehrman changed his view and – the book that I just read from on the screen, mm -hmm. that's from 2019. 
he hasn't changed his view at all. So when all the the entire group that I was talking to were saying that Bar Ehrman changed his mind, I asked for a source. I never got one. But then I'm bringing up a more recent source than misquoting Jesus. And it still quotes him saying that he still believes that that and it's and it's a more, um, you know, recent, uh, you know, source than right. even what Miss Gordon Jesus says. And here's let me actually get what he said, because it's interesting if I can find it. Oh, actually, I think there it is. So this is actually what he said, and I'll read it. Um, and one of the questions, let me see, let me just make sure. OK, so the question he was asked was. Bruce Metzger, your mentor and a textual critic or a textual criticism, by the way, by the way, I'm reading this and I have it highlighted right here what he actually said of them quoting him when he said this. And this is in um, a Q&A section that is actually that was added to the back of the book, but nonetheless, it's still his book. And so Bart Ehrman published this answer. And he says, Bruce Metzger, your mentor in textual criticism to whom this book is dedicated, has said that there is nothing in these variants of scripture that challenges any essential Christian beliefs. And, th and this is where they're quoting, e.g., the bodily resurrection of Jesus or the Trinity. So he's even asked about the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the Trinity. And it, the question goes on to say, why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? And he goes on to say, and I'm quoting Bart Ehrman here, Bruce Metzger is one of the great scholars of modern times, and I dedicated the, the book to him because he was both my inspiration for going into textual criticism and the person who trained me in the field. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, he is a firmly committed Christian, and I am not. We are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual questions. If he and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement. So even he notes that what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like. Right. There would be very few points of disagreement. And he's saying this about a Christian, Bruce Metzger, of all people. Maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousands. And right. this is the kicker. The position I argue for in Misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So – even if you want to talk about corruption, that if you want to go to First John 5, 7, or if you want to go to Mark 1, 1, or if you want to go to other things like Acts 13, or people talk about with, <clears throat> um, you know, the Great Commission, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there are some manuscripts that have deteriorated over time, but we don't know right. if it was there. But it's like, uh, that's a different story in and of itself. But nonetheless, Christianity still is true if you base it off of the... Um, base it off of, you know, if what we believe in is based on a corrupted text because it's been changed over time, textual variants and everything like that. Again, if your belief in Islam is contingent upon that, then you will leave Islam the further you dive deeper into it. Because, again, when it comes to it, I keep saying it over and over again. The core essential Christian doctrines, and I've in multiple sources, they were given examples say that Trinity, the resurrection, crucifixion, deity of Christ, those are the those are counted as essential Christian doctrines. Those are not right. those are not affected. So at the end of the day, we still can have Christianity at its core doctrine, core value, and still be Christians today, despite all of the any well, despite any textual variant, really, because we we have what we have, and so that's why I was actually because you actually had mentioned the whole if John had an additional n or something like that. Th that's yep. actually uh, something that's so even we're talking about like the the longer ending of um of, of, of Mark or of John. Yeah, the long yeah, yeah. So that's that's a different one, by the way. Yeah. Um, but even but here's the funny thing about the longer ending of Mark is even if you have the shorter ending of Mark, there's there's multiple things that are still within Mark that are the essential Christian doctrines. You have the crucifixion for one, 
Jesus was right. crucified. And then if you have the shorter ending of Mark, you still have the empty tomb. So then you still have to explain the empty tomb. And then when it comes to the other gospels, depending on what you think the sources are for the gospels, whether you hold to the synoptic problem or synoptic gospels with John, anything like that, you still have multiple sources of the disciples experiencing a bodily resurrected Jesus. And, but you still have the crucifixion and all the sources either way right. that talk about, you know, was he crucified? Was he not crucified? All of them say he was crucified. And, but what I was referring to was, um, how, Oh, here it is. Um, where John's name with, uh, one or two, uh, well, new is the letter that gives the N sound in Greek. And so the new, yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah. So, and that's actually one of the most common textual variants um, in the in in all of it. Most of it is really just misspelling, but it doesn't change anything because whether it's John with you know two news or with just one new, it's right. still John nonetheless. And when it comes to pretty much all what it, all textual variants and things like that, that's of the main ones. You have very few uh, that are. Oh, I think can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think my um camera just uh <laughs> I like that face though. I think my camera just actually Oh it froze, yeah. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Let me fix that real quick. Because what's gonna happen is And by the way, when you're ready, um yeah. uh I got all my stuff loaded up to kind of uh present the evidence and what I was talking about. And guys, I'll um uh on on my stream uh, and, and, and I'll send these links to you too as, as well, Hunter. Sure. But when I air this on, on my channel, guys, mm -hmm. I will put all the links to everything that I'm showing you in the description box so that, uh, you can have evidence and proof and so that you can present the argument. Um, so yeah. Uh, so well, whenever you're ready, I'll, uh, present. yeah, well, real quick, um, just when it comes to, uh, texture variants, it's, it is helpful to keep two categories in mind. And the first is whether the variant is important for interpretation and most variants don't affect the meaning of the text, but, and that's what I was talking about with the spelling differences with the, you know, changing of John, whether it's two news or one new and it pretty much think of it as like with English with like a or an, um, it, one ends with the letter N, one doesn't, yet it doesn't change the meaning. Um, but when it comes to these types of variants, they occur throughout manuscripts. But with any major edition of the Greek New Testament, like I noticed or like I showed with the Allen, um, Nestle Allen 28th edition, I got so many books everywhere, <laughs> that um, – Pretty much they will bear out page for page, like the textual variants and everything like that. Yet they still write down what they believe is original. And they don't pose any threat to the Christian faith or to the Bible's inspiration. And what they just show is that scribes or readers were at times willing to make the text read more clearly. And so whenever it talks about – um, like – text over time you actually quoted that verse in the Quran where things are added or taken away or anything like that if anything um i don't i haven't seen to where any i haven't seen to where any manuscripts have like taken out but instead where like for example the kjv versus niv a lot of people make the argument like niv takes verses out of the bible where the kjv originally had it in well that's right. not ne that's not necessarily the case because of what's known as lectionaries which those are manuscripts that have assigned scripture readings for various days of the week and the lectionaries would add clarification to the text because they pull passages out of their larger contact passages and what they would do is they would often like use like uh well okay so just they would use like text but they would add clarification like for example one of the ones that i found out about was mark 6 and uh verses 31 through 8 or chapter 8 verse 26 where in the text it uses pronouns like for jesus we know this is jesus because he's talking in um uh, chapters 4 and 5 and what a lot of lectionaries did, what a lot of lecturers did, is they added Jesus' name in there for clarification in the manuscripts, even though originally we know that it didn't use the name Jesus. But what ultimately happened was they 
would add the nouns there to identify who the person is in view. But the majority of the later manuscripts, they're the ones that add Jesus into it. And so when we go back to the earlier witnesses, the referent there is still Jesus. Like all of that is still the same. It's still replying to Jesus. They didn't really add anything that changed the meaning of the text or anything like that. They just add that for clarification to their readers because they're not going all the way back to Mark 4 or Mark 5 or anything like that to show that this is Jesus here that's being referred to here. And so right. that's how that's an example of how we can know with like adding over to it. And again, it's a bit overstated to say that it was changed over time. With the KJV, for example, that have the additional text in it, at most it's 2%. That's it of the entire New Testament. When you take that 2% away, we can actually get, again, like what was said before about the 28th edition and the 13th edition of Nestle Allen. We can know very well what the originals say. And I've quoted sources, recent sources, this is scholarship today, that say that we can know what originals say. So right. we you have know, that. You know, um, and um, I'm, I'm going to have to go in about five minutes. Yep. Um, but I, I just wanted to say um, this is why it, it, it really helps to understand what you believe and why you believe it, not just like a surface level, like, oh, well, you know, somebody said I should be a Christian or my mom's a Christian. Or when we actually get down to the crux of our faith, it's not just experiential. It's not just anecdotal. It's actually backed up by historical facts, backed up by strong textual um, uh, proofs. Um, textual criticism comes against it and it still is able to hold water. It still stands its ground. Um, so guys, just make sure that, you know, this isn't something that's passive to you, like that this is something that you actually are taking serious, that this is something that is actually important to you and share the information. Um, I'll just share this one last thing and, yep. and then far quick. Um, so I don't know if you can share, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me see. I'll, uh, because I just want to provide everybody with what I was saying. I don't think that I'm lying. Uh, let me know. Okay. Yep. Great. So this is a website that I that I use for um, like you can look at it for like textual variants and things like that. Nkaran.com. Um, and again, on my stream, I'll provide the links and stuff in the description, but I'll also send them to Hunter so they'll be under his description as well. Um, but um, so. Uh, so right here, this is one of the Kira'at. Um, so notice it says Khalif and uh, Yusuf. I mean Khalif and uh, Hamza. I'm sorry. Um, so this is like um, Khalif on the authority of Hamza. Um, and notice right here. I'll zoom in a bit. Bel Ajib two. There is a Dhamma over top, but on n.com. Notice here there is a fatha, right? So it changes it. It changes the meaning. Now, um, this is what would be a qira'a, a different reading. This is a variant. Um, again, khalif on uh, Hamza. So this is khalif on the authority of Hamza. Here, um, sorry, I'll put it right here. So again, right here, you can see that. Uh, these were, so like uh, the people that were in the, in the Qur'an reading on um, this website right here on Qur'an.com, if you look at it, Hamza al um, uh, Kasai and Khalif right here. So um, what I want to do really quick as well, it's completed. What I want to do really quick as well right here is um, I want to also share this tab so that you can see that it, it does mean like wonder um, or to be amazed at something as opposed to what they do here is gravely no, I don't even know what that means, gravely noted. I don't know why they would uh, put that or, I mean, you could say astonish, yes, but wonder uh, would be a more, you know, to be shocked or to be amazed, to wonder uh, would be a more accurate translation. Um, here's a website that I use, um, a, a, a good brother in Christ of mine, Jai from um, Jai Apologetics. Um, he sent me this, this website, this is uh, like an Arabic, like almanac, lexicon, dictionary, you type in the root word and it'll give you the definition. Um, so I was able to type in uh, right here, uh, ajib, right here. Uh, and it gives you like a word, like um, right here. So it says la, um, la ajib, 
or a la ajiba, which means like like no wonder. So it's like a euphemism almost in this sense when you put la in front of it. It's kind of like like no wonder, dude. Um, or um, uh, uh, no wonder, uh, my dear la um, ajib uh, uh, ajiba uh, habibi or something like that, right? So essentially, right here, um, you can see that it means to wonder, right? Astonishing uh, revelation. Um, so if we go back here and we're looking at it, we're understanding the argument, it wouldn't necessarily be an issue for Muhammad to wonder. Uh, but now it's problematic because now Allah is wondering. He's like, he's in a mate. Like what? Like, what is Allah wondering about? What would God in a sense, in, in this sense, be shocked about or be amazed about? Right. Like what would catch Allah off guard that he has to wonder you know, like, what are these people doing in a sense? Um, but nonetheless, even if you want to say that's not an issue, because maybe you're as as ascribing um, like um, anthropomorphic features uh, to Allah, even though the Muslims say there's nothing like uh, Allah, um, you know, he's, you know, all wise, you know, all knowing. What do they say? They say, um, uh, uh, off the top of my head, um, I think it's like uh, which means like he's like all knowing, all wise. Yet in this situation, he has to wonder about something. Um, yeah, I believe it's uh, which means like uh, he is all wise. Hmm. Um, but anyways, uh, essentially, the argument here would just be, OK, so what is he wondering about? But even if you want to go with you're going to ascribe anthropomorphic features to Allah, it still becomes problematic because um you still have the issue of well these are two different readings like one uh reading is this one reading is that and they are not the same um so and, and i'll just share this one last thing um just for further evidence so well, this is a, a website called cool uh like cool like as in dude that's cool c-o-o-l uh Jigator up here this is a website that you can go to you type in arabic verbs and it'll give you the conjugations in every tense um so here we have right here so this is in the past tense he's one because he's wondering he wondered um notice so um anna so this is like i that's what you would use for like 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 i'm like so for instance if i say um um and i'm a siahi like i'm a christian right um anna is for i um so like um like I, so I wondered, uh, Ajib too. You see it here? So the speaker is Allah. So that's why it has Ajib too. He's wondering, like Allah is shocked. Something's catching him off guard. He's wondering why, like what's going on here. But when it's in the you, um, uh, Enta, uh, notice you have the Fatha over here uh, where it says um, you. So that's why in the reading, in, in the Hafs, when it's reading it, because, you know, Allah supposedly uh, talking to Muhammad and he's, you know, he's saying that you're, you know, you wondered, right, Muhammad? So he says, Bal um, Ajibta, like you're wondering, but this one says Bal uh, Ajibtu, it changes. One is Allah speaking, one is, um, um, uh, Muhammad speaking. So again, I'll, um, I'll put all of these links in my description at the bottom so you can check those out. Um, and I'll send them to my brother Hunter here so he can put them under the, under the description as well. But, um, I, I'll just say this, this one last thing bef before I go guys notice how important it is to understand these arguments and to present them correctly. And notice how important it is for you as a Christian to understand why what you believe and understand the scholarship that goes behind these things. Because Hunter, you know, he was able to beautifully explain to us like the scholarship behind this, the textual criticism, and all it's going to do. Yeah, I had examples too, but you know, we ran out of time. So. Yeah, um, but yeah, we're, I, we're 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 definitely going to have to do this again, man. Oh yeah, it's going to take at least two hours. Yeah, for sure. Maybe maybe it'll take two days. We will just do a forty-eight hour long live stream where we'll just never we'll never Ooh. sleep right <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we'll uh we'll uh eat 10 ajwa that day or something <laughs> we'll just stay up all day um but um lots of coffee right lots of coffee but um uh, but it's just this stuff is important guys so 
it is. you know, un- understand, you know, your, your, your Dean, understand why you believe what you believe. You don't even have to be a native Arabic speaker. Like, like, look at me, I've been studying it for less than two years, but what I do is I take the time, lots of time to make sure that I understand what it's, what's being said and understand like the tenses and all this stuff, because it matters. You never know when you present this information to somebody, how it'll be able to bring them out of the darkness into the glorious gospel, into the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And also to kind of piggyback off of that, when it comes to knowing what your foundation is, knowing how strong your structure is, this is one of the things that really help build that up when you get into these conversations or when you are um, when you are given these kind of things from people who are not of the same kind of background. And so by studying and actually knowing what is being said, how these things work, you don't have to go and get a PhD to know this stuff. Like, I mean, there are sources out there. I just showed two sources both christian and non-christian that say the exact same thing that are books that people can just go and buy it's not just something that you can just learn from a college it's something that you can know here and now and if you need sources you have people here that are willing to help that are willing to give you those sources and to show you exactly what it is that people do say because i was going to go into example with like acts 13 verse 33 for example where there's like three understandings and because of the way the wording like just to, real quick, just to give this example, um, it's what's known as it, it's pretty awkward since uh, the way that some of the phrases are made in subtextual variants, but the wording in such cases like this is what seems to be the earliest is easy to reconstruct because you have of this what's known as a nonsense error. So it makes no sense. It's awkward within the text. So you have these criteria, so to speak, to know what was actually originally said. And because of these things, we know what's originally said. We can have a strong foundation to stand on. Christ still lives according to all the text <laughs> when it comes to any proclaimed contradiction, textual variant. Christ still lives according to the essential Christian doctrine of the faith from the beginning we and i can go into oral tradition as well with that as well i've done a study on that also and again guys this is all out there you just got to go and research don't let your doubts become your conclusions study this stuff see if there are, are any sources or anything that helps you reconcile these issues because there's been this has been going on for 2000 years heck even to muslims i would even say like study hard because i i actually enjoy an honest conversation to where if I am speaking to a Muslim who is very studious within the field, then I am willing to listen because they have studied so much. They're able to reconcile. But that way we can actually show what is true at the end of the day. That's how we can get down to this. And that's why we're I'm, personally I'm studying New Testament just because, you know, I want to know whether it's true. And from my studies and from my research, I believe it's true. And so that's why I'm a Christian and I'm willing to have that conversation. So if you. You know how to reach yep. me. I'll the links down in the description if you want to contact me to have a conversation or anything like that. But other than that, it's it's been real good. This has been a good study. Of course, an hour doesn't do its justice, but Suffice, we got to right. Yeah, so yeah, we got to. I, I got. We, yeah, my my, my weekends are so tentative, so that's why I'm like I, I hate to. What what so what we we'll probably have to do is maybe do something during the weekday, um, or if you ever get some time. But um, but yeah, man, it, it was it was awesome. Uh, we're going to have to do this again. There's going to, there's definitely going to be a part two, um, where we're going over some of, uh, some of the other quote unquote, um, contradictions or some of the quote unquote issues, uh, where textual criticism is concerned. But, um, but yeah, man, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get out of here, but, um, guys definitely, you know, uh, if you haven't already liked the video for both of our streams, subscribe, um, subscribe, right. Um, comment under the actual video. Uh, again, this is just for the algorithm. That's the only thing that we're asking from you guys. We're not asking for anything else. Uh, it'll just help to get this message out uh, to people as well. Yeah. Also leave a comment if, because again, I enjoy the conversation. So if you wanted to just leave a comment, just to ask a question or to make me think of something, have me think of something, I'd love to read them. I like to, I try to read all my comments if I can, and let's just have the conversation. Cause it's not necessarily, you know, for me. When it comes to it, it just, um, it's not just, you know, I love doing this. I love having the conversation. Yep. So if you want to leave a comment, like, subscribe, let's, you know, get this around so that we can build more fruitful conversations for this kind of stuff. And so with that, I think, uh, I think we're pretty good. So there you go. Yep.
<laughs> All right, man. All right. Well, it was nice talking to you guys. For those of you who are still here, uh, if you're still watching the uh, replays, and uh, it was good talking to you, Hunter. We'll uh, yeah. we'll we'll definitely do this again, man. Yeah, you as well, man. God bless and take care. All right, you too. God bless. See you. See you.